One of the things that I think uh, is, is foundational to addressing what we need to change in the broad scope of everything that's been discussed today is how we um, grow, distribute, and eat food. We all know the, uh, the problems with industrial agriculture is to a large the loss of biodiversity um, is massive. There's a book that, um, I forget the name of the top of my head, goes through this. used to be 80 different kinds of commercial tomatoes. There are now three, right? So the loss of biodiversity um, and the loss of varietals within, uh, within products. Uh, the high energy inputs in agriculture are, are intense, from fertilizer to pesticide, um, herbicides, and of course moving the product to market. Uh, and it's the, the storage and distribution chains which largely drive um, our loss of genetic diversity in our seeds, which make us less resilient um, to diseases and pests. And also, of course, changing weather conditions. You've seen this um, more with rice than with some other products. Um, you see the degradation of soil and water with compaction and chemical loading, uh, or both. And of course, you see a lot less nutritious food that comes out of industrial agriculture versus organic or local small-scale uh, focused food production. Uh, these problems arise uh, largely because of scale. Because of the scale of agribusiness, you have an accountability to um, government treaties and multinational grocery corporations, not to consumers. There are, I think, four, uh, four companies which control 95% of the groceries in Israel. Um, just for an issue of who's accountable to who and what kind of control ways consumers really have over what we eat. Uh, the scale of agribusiness also does not lend itself to organic production. Um, you can't go out and remove potato bugs by hand, you can't get them off. And locally, you have to use the spray. Um, so those are the. I'm actually forward this today. Should I click on it? Oh, you're wrong. Yep. Okay. So um, that's kind of the overview of what we need to change. And we'll look at three different things that are going on in New Zealand um, that counter this trend. That are our ways of starting. Um, the first one is the Kwanga Institute. Um, I'll say first they're, they're moving into a relationship with a community land trust. This is forming now. Uh, and they'll be leasing a portion of the land for seed preservation and seed raising. Um, they run workshops, internships, apprenticeships, um, and if you go to their website, they have information on everything from recipes to information or to um, appropriate technology. Um, they raise and distribute um, New Zealand heritage seeds. When you go on the website to look at the seeds, a lot of the seeds have a story about this was brought over in 1880 by such and such and has been kept alive by this family in this town. Um, until they gave us, and they're raising and distributing across New Zealand. Uh, they have 700 lines of heritage New Zealand seeds that they distribute. Uh, they're reasonably priced, they're all organically produced, and uh, some are produced, or some are distributed for sale, and some of them are distributed um, to members only. When you're a membership, you get two packets of particular seeds that they want to distribute and, and maintain the the genetic diversity of vegetable growing in New Zealand. All proceeds um, go back to uh, maintaining the seeds, growing the seeds, and, and keeping a genetically diverse uh, food crop in New Zealand. Three quick things about home gardening. If we look at the wider scale of what we need to change, um, it preserves and distributes gen genetic diversity um, across a wide area. It also allows for a um, high level of, of, um, of resilience. And it's important to think about, it's not just resilience in terms of your family has enough to eat, but as more people garden in a community, you build up a communal resilience of knowledge about the climate, about pests, about what grows, about how to deal with plants. So um, pushing gardening at home is an economic benefit, but it's also a benefit in terms of um, community resilience. If the place is high, uh, is this going to leave that echo on it? It like sounds it? like it to you, but apparently it's all right. It's all right out there? Okay, so it's kind of distracting up here. Uh, it replaces or can replace a high um, high chemical pesticide input grass lawns uh, with vegetables. One of the highest, the two highest uses of domestic water in Christchurch um, are uh, watering lawns and washing cars with hoses. So if you imagine if the water that goes into watering lawns was actually going to vegetable production, there's, there's a huge multiple benefits to that. 
I have five minutes. Um, the second one, so that's home gardening safe too. So that they, they can plan their season without having to worry about loans from the bank, without having to worry about financing things. Um, and because you distribute what's grown, you, you share the risk of farming. We think of farming as something now as a business, something that someone goes out and does and tries to make a profit, rather than as a way a community feeds itself. One of the, um, quick side note, I'm going to have to run out of the rest of it. The law of the Indies, um, which, in which most of the Americas are settled, you got a lot in town, but you also got a lot next to town to vegetables. And if you didn't grow food for the community, you lost your right to live in town. Okay? So food used to be something that you produced as a group to maintain yourself, not as something that someone produced to sell to someone else. Um, what am I going to miss about this one? The two points. Um, the one in Wellington works with, with six farmers. Very often, um, you work with one farmer. And one small farm can usually generate enough for 100 annual subscriptions. So it can feed 100, uh, say, two to three person families. You can buy multiple shares if you want. Uh, in the States, many CAs have community shares. They have um, low income shares. They have work shares. So that the, the vegetables can be distributed across a wider um, economic diversity and also address issues of equity in our food supply. And it doesn't have to be just vegetables. There are also CSAs that um, take on meat, uh, dairy, uh, eggs. I think those are all the ones there. Uh, this is, you know, right here. These are all the community gardens in Christchurch. Um, this is another scale of locally produced food. And it, it, these are managed in many different ways. We look at um, Linwood, New Brighton. OK, I thought that was me. The, uh, People work the lots communally in part. You can also have a model where you work individually. We have a uh, plot and a garden out at Lincoln. Uh, the, we work individually. There's a mixture of shared plots that people go in and do together, and then private plots. Um, last year, we probably raised 60 to 70 percent of our uh, vegetables over the year. We'll probably do better this year between our home garden and the community garden. So you can imagine that's low. No, I'm supposed to be standing here. I missed that. I'm sorry. I hope it wasn't completely all right. Um, community gardens, so there's, there's not just that, but there's a number of different things they can offer. In um, 2009, Christchurch City Council offered um, composting classes through the community gardens. The um, Strickland Street Garden has classes everything from seed saving through to um, pickling. They have three or four market days per year so that people can see what kind of produce is available locally. Um, it's common uh, in the states that community gardens will get um, support from municipal governments in exchange for being open as public space a certain number of hours a year. And I know one in Seattle, they raise so much extra food, they donated over 15,000 pounds of food a year to the local food banks that the communities put together through their effort and then um, distribute. So I've got about 30 seconds left. Um, so this move to local food, which I think is critical to any form of resilience and to addressing the kinds of issues we face globally and locally, uh, it improves our resilience, uh, particularly as we're looking at changing um, energy regimes as energy gets more expensive and shipping, storing, transporting, running big tractors becomes uh, prohibitive. Uh, it improves the health of the population the health benefits of organic but locally fresh food are um, impressive if you go in and, and compare them. And that's a stop. And I will say that it fosters social capital, which is probably the biggest thing you need to think about. Thank you.